So I was wondering, in a, as a general question, um, with the two new ones that you've shown, I always think that when you're, when you're showing something, you're probably, to a certain extent, having to reflect on them, probably because of the Q&As as well. But where you feel you are right now in your, your filmmaking? Well, when, when I uh, start showing some work, some new work, um, uh, there's usually a curtain that comes down and uh, I stop functioning as a filmmaker for uh, a while. Uh, it could be a week, it could be a month, it could be longer, it really depends. Uh, at that point it's a question of uh, pulling back, looking at the work that you've done and uh, also trying to, making an attempt to articulate uh, what you think was happening in the works and where the works are coming from. When I'm working, it's a, uh, a dialogue with myself and the things that I see on screen that are happening or on a monitor, depending whether I'm working with film or uh, digital media. Is that something that, when you have to deliver, say, like a Q&A, there tends to be questions that want to maybe demystify the process? Yeah, uh, it's, it's difficult because, I, uh, as I said last night, I do work intuitively uh, and I make my decisions based upon uh, a lifetime of uh, experience, responses, uh, not only to uh, materials I'm working with and what I see are the potentials, but also my personal life. Yeah, so, uh, and that not just involves uh, working with a moving image, but um, you know, some things that may be very, very personal. You know, and uh, I have to distance them. Uh, in terms of my uh, material that relates to what might have prompted a work, for example, um, I try to keep that uh, really uh, under the rug, so to speak. Uh, because that's not something somebody else can pick up. And uh, uh, that would be a problem if I start putting it in front of people. I think uh, they should respond to what's actually there, you know, have their own experience rather than trying to uh, see it through my eyes or, you know. So you have to draw a line maybe as far even as, as you say with the personal element and that even comes up I guess with the, the Scott McDonald uh, interview, I know that was like a point which is like with personal cinema such as this, how much do you explain about yeah. it? Well, there is also a difference between um, releasing a work, showing it uh, the first few times and being able to articulate what you feel, what you can convey about it to other people. Uh, there are different languages that we use, for one thing. So, uh, you know, when, when I'm looking at a work while I'm working on it, uh, I'm living with it, and I do not use coherent uh, verbal language. I might use a word or two here and there, uh, but then I fill in in between uh, through another language, you know, which isn't verbal. So then when I'm in front of uh, a group of individuals who are asking me questions, you know, I, I find myself in a situation of trying to put those uh, experiences into language, communicable language, another language, you know, another communicable language. Uh, and that sometimes takes me a while before I can manage to do that. And I think that may be true for other people too. You know, so. Uh, with the, uh, the new ones, uh, I wanted to ask you about the um, recurrence of trains in your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, funny, you know, that's almost as uh, something, um, well, let, let, let me offer you 
uh, a different experience. You know, uh, earlier this year, I think in April, or was it? I, I believe it was in April, March. Uh, I showed some, uh, two programs in Los Angeles uh, at RATCAT, and uh, one was a film program and a digital program. And the film program, for example, was just the early work in chronological order from uh, Morning, the first 60 millimeter film I released through Serene Velocity. Uh, and I hadn't seen them in that order in a long time, decades, to be quite frank with you about it. And uh, it was, I was impressed. I said, gee, did I really do that after this? That was very intelligent. You know, it's almost like there was a plan and there wasn't. One work uh, was realized, I had no idea what on earth I was going to do next. And then at some point, the next work came into being for whatever reason, you know. So, uh, so they are, uh, it's very hard to, um, uh, I, I also like to leave the works open to some degree uh, rather than lock them in into some particular way of seeing. I think each of us, you, me, and anybody else who's looking at the work is coming from somewhere else, depending on your own needs, your own education, uh, your own ways of seeing things, you know, and um, also cultures, you know, maybe, you know, if the works survive for another 10, 15, 20 years or more, <coughs> I assume they will be seen quite differently uh, as uh, people might see it today, you know, so um, who knows what, it, what they will look like to an audience in 50 years from now, you know, so I'd be interested in knowing, but I'm not going to be around that long, <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway. Uh, did I uh, get off track? I was asking about trains. Oh, oh yeah. trains, yeah. Well, trains and cars, yeah. and I've tried n not to go back to them. Every, uh, I think after I made a uh, film in 1969, um, Transparency, I said, okay, don't touch cars anymore. And there you go, there's uh, Auto Collider, you know. So uh, a, a work I had not intended. Uh, you know, at the before uh, approaching that material, um, I didn't want to touch uh, cars. I had made a number of other works. You've seen one, Shift, you know. Uh, again, I said after that one, okay, no more cars, please. But there, are, uh, well, there are two things. One is they're convenient sometimes as uh, uh, indirect vehicles r relative to the medium that I'm working with, uh, or, w well, was working with film, you know, to say product of the machine age, and so is the car. Uh, so they came into being more or less around the same time, turn of the century, late 19th century, early 20th century. So uh, they're uh, brothers of sorts, uh, and part of a larger, uh, um, umbrella called the machine and the industrial revolution. You know? So they're they're part of that world. So there's a reason, and and uh, the trains are likewise. You know, they're uh, this great 19th century symbol of uh, the machine age. You know, it's how it all started in a way. Not necessarily that there weren't any uh, machines and industrial developments before that. You know, definitely there were factories already and there were other methods besides uh, the, um, the trains, but uh, the train had a, a big uh, saying in, in terms of uh, the Industrial Revolution and what it ended up doing. But I'm not touching on that in, uh, what is it, departure, you know. Mm -hmm. you know that, that's uh, distant in a way, you know. I'm not dealing with the Industrial Revolution <laughs> right there. Yeah, so it would be too large a, a topic for me. I like 
Uh, to approach works also um, on a humane, everyday level, mundane level, you might say. Um, I don't necessarily like to touch um, topics that are on a pedestal, you know. It's uh, too much of a generality that you're dealing with. Um, I, I make works that emanate from individual, from an individual, and it's addressed to other individuals in the world. Not to an audience, you know, but to individuals in the world. Um, that's very important to me. So if someone is touched by the work in some way, uh, or, you know, reaches them in some ways, that's wonderful. Um, you know. I, I don't know how to address an audience, you know, I don't, you know, it's, everyone, everyone, everyone is uh, somewhat different, you know, so. so. There's the, uh, the observation that the, the train window is like a screen in the cinema. That's yes, it, it is. Uh, and, you know, riding the train, it's a movie, you know, it's, uh, even walking into it, this is besides the fact that uh, at the turn of the century, uh, uh, a genre that was very popular uh, were the uh, phantom rides, you know, rides from trains, boats, and I guess maybe some other vehicle as well, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> but beyond that, you know, it, it's true. And then uh, you sit down, I mean, the, the place is like a theater, an enclosed space, and then it leaves the station, you know. My God, you know, look out the window. If you give yourself to that, you see the world. It's like a movie, yes. Yeah. It also, in some strange way, uh, I'm being professorial right now, and I don't mean to, but uh, it does recall to me, uh, I'm much interested in the history of the moving image uh, and in history in general. So even if a particular work doesn't necessarily uh, touch upon that issue, which I don't think, well, maybe I'll back, back, backtrack. Uh, in some ways it does, uh, possibly, uh, but only indirectly. I, I'm not dealing with history right now, but uh, the work in some ways I think uh, also relates to the moving panorama before film, you know, uh, these large uh, painted canvases that would uh, move across, uh, you know, a, a frame of some sort, and people would sit there, uh, thrilled by the, this passing panorama going from Venice to Istanbul or whatever, you know, uh, and some sound effects with it, you know, which. Um, so it, 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 you know, it's uh, like um, it echoes developments that preceded it. Nothing happens in a vacuum, you know, so. But with the departure, there's the inversion of the, the frame as well, so you also get that added level as an audience member that you're not in the train, but this is also make you aware that you're watching something. Yes, uh, that's to me very important. Um, uh, not, not necessarily in every work, but most of the time, uh, an awareness uh, that you're, it's a, a kind of a picture window, yet it's not quite uh, a, uh, a picture window. You know, you're not in it, you're outside of it. Uh, and the phenomena that's taking place to me is being aware of uh, the visual world in which uh, you're in when you're looking at a work to me is very important. And when I say that, I don't mean I, uh, as a viewer, I need to know all the time uh, where the audience is, uh, you know, that there are things beyond the rectangle. I actually, uh, when I'm looking at a cinematic work, uh, regardless of whether it's film or digital, uh, I like to see the rectangle and nothing but the rectangle. The rest of it is not information uh, that I, as a filmmaker, have included. You know? But there are wonderful things to notice. For example, 
uh, along the border of the rectangle, be it the right, left, top, or bottom, you know, and how the image is cut, you know, and seeing the things happening just within that rectangle, you know, having no extensions, yet reading as though there are extensions to it, aware that there are those possibilities, you know. And now you're dealing with the, the rectangle of 16 by 9 instead of 4 by 3. How did that uh, uh, affect, like, the composition of... Uh, yeah, it took me, uh, it was a struggle uh, to start with. Um, I think to some degree I, I can uh, switch back and forth at this point. And I do like HD. I mean, uh, the clarity, or clarity, maybe that's the wrong word, mm -hmm. the sharpness relative to uh, standard DV uh, is very interesting to me. There are things I can do that I would never do with uh, uh, standard TV. Uh, departure is an example. Uh, with, uh, you know, departure is on HD. So with standard TV, working with a wide angle lens uh, would be more problematic because it breaks up, unless that's what you want. You know, you want a softness on the screen. But one of the things that I much appreciate about uh, the, this new, for me, new format, it's been around for a long time, you know. People have worked with it, either with a single camera or uh, with uh, three cameras, you know, it goes back to the 20s, uh, this film, what was it, Napoleon, you know, and blah, 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 okay. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so th uh, that work allows that. Uh, I did an installation in 2010 called, um, uh, uh, Surveillance. Uh, it was done for a park uh, in New York, uh, Madison Square Park. And uh, I uh, submitted a proposal. I never thought they would accept it. Uh, it's m mainly sculptors who, uh, with uh, gallery names that usually uh, get commissions from them. Uh, and to my surprise, they said, yes, we would like you to do this, you know. <laughs> um, so it, it's an installation that was going to take place in the park. There were four channels, uh, four screens, monitors, and uh, they were all uh, HD. So uh, I wasn't going to put a three by four rectangle within it. Nope, I had to work with that format. So, and I think it was, I had a good solution for it. And I hope whoever listens to this tape eventually gets to see it. Right now, uh, it, I think until the end of the year or maybe early next year, uh, uh, if anybody in Washington DC or uh, lives there or is going to Washington, D.C., you could see it actually at the Smithsonian uh, American Museum of Art. Uh, not, at, not at the um, uh, Hirshhorn Museum, but at the Smithsonian Museum of American Art. Um, they uh, decided to purchase the piece. Uh, some cur uh, a curator from the museum was in New York and he really liked the piece, so uh, he asked me to submit a copy of it. I didn't expect them to purchase it, uh, and they did. It was the first time uh, a big museum chose to, uh, you know, purchase one of my works. So, uh, I mean, uh, installation works. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and uh, I saw it uh, installed in March, and I thought it was, it looked very good, and I liked it. How did it? change with the setting, I imagine? Uh, well, it's, again, something else, right? No, it's not. Origi uh, originally, it was meant, see, talking about this whole thing, about being aware of where things happen. Uh, surveillance uh, was done for the park, and I filmed most of the time. I'm using the word film in quotation marks. Sometimes I slip. I recorded or taped whatever term you want to use. Um, um, 
around noontime, and uh, I, uh, I was hoping that there'd be many regulars, people from the neighborhood. This is on Fifth Avenue and 23rd Street Park, and it's packed with people around lunchtime, people who work in the area, uh, often just bring their lunch or eat. At, there are a couple places where you can eat. You know, I mean, there are many places you can purchase food around there. And then they sit in the park for an hour before going back to the office or some other place where they work. Um, and I was hoping that they would be able to find themselves on screen um, just you know, and say that they're in the movie and then there'd be somebody else saying, hey, wait a minute, isn't this person the person who's on the screen right now? You know, so, um, um, and that also goes back to a form of cinema uh, that uh, to the turn of the century, 19th, 20th century, where uh, films were made um, for a local audience, not necessarily for a uh, national or international audience, but movie, local movies where um, a company would go, uh, would be hired by a uh, theater, for example. Uh, theater may be the wrong word, but a, uh, a venue, a movie venue, and they would go out and record uh, people, and they, they would have signs, and they would announce, come and see yourself on screen uh, tomorrow or next week, you know, and most of the audience quite often were those very people and their friends. They would go and watch themselves on screen, and I thought that was wonderful. Also, uh, the installation uh, w was up uh, until like nine o'clock in the evening, uh, unless uh, the equipment wasn't working. That happened more than once. Uh, so uh, people would be able then to see the park during the day. So can you imagine, there, there's a, uh, uh, a restaurant, you know, and I, I'm not trying to advertise it, so I'm not going to mention it, uh, but it's very popular. Um, it's in the park itself, and um, that's where the monitors are. And I thought it would be interesting for them to come and see themselves um, in the evening, or people, you would see the park uh, during the day on screen in the evening, you know, when it's... So, um, anyway, how, does, how did it look uh, in Washington? Uh, it's, it was different, uh, but the idea of surveillance, uh, which I was also considered uh, in a playful way uh, in, um, in the park, uh, was much more articulate here. You know, although uh, th there is an interesting experience uh, after the, uh, the work was installed um, and running, I actually tried to make a document of it. And on one occasion, uh, when I was uh, taping, uh, I went in there, and uh, somebody at one point who uh, was there with a whole group of people, maybe 20, uh, came over and uh, said, hi, Ernie. I, I looked at him, and it's uh, somebody who works in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, I, I had met him before, really very nice person. Uh, I would mention his name, but I just can't remember right now. Um, and he said, so when was that done? And so we talked a little bit about it. It's actually in, in a document, this whole thing that I'm mentioning. I, I gave it, you know, it's part of, uh, uh, the purchase of uh, the installation I gave uh, the Smithsonian, this tape, where this, what I'm describing now is on tape, you know, so. Um, and he said some of the crew thought uh, uh, that they were being taped, <laughs> <laughs> but they couldn't find themselves, you know, so that, that was amusing. Here, here is a, uh, uh, a film crew who uh, thought they were on, on camera, you know, so the, the whole idea of surveillance, it, there's, it's, you know, I'm playing with the idea, okay? I'm making, uh, hopefully, people aware of the idea of surveillance and the way it's, um, in that particular work, um, plays 
a role in contemporary society. It's very hard to get away from it one way or another, you know. And I don't have to go into that, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, not only video cameras, but, you know, many other ways in which surveillance takes place. So uh, here there were four uh, screens, four channels, uh, one placed next to the other. Uh, with, it's not just a full rectangle, uh, but I, 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 there's a rectangle within a rectangle. Uh, so there's a smaller rectangle and a larger rectangle. Sometimes the two are synchronous and the same, and sometimes they are not synchronous, and that's when things get very confusing. And sometimes the two uh, are fairly different, too. So there's a play, and, and what my idea here, uh, if you want to think about it that way, uh, was that the inner rectangle was a surveillance camera in the outer rectangle, uh, the, uh, the world uh, that the video or the surveillance camera was uh, aiming into. Okay. So, uh, but visually, there are amusing things happening that way. In seeing the four next to one another, in the park, they were not placed that way. If you think of this table, for example, one was east, west, north, south, so they were dispersed that way. That's uh, where they were in the park. So I couldn't change that uh, setup. You know? So uh, I accepted it. So, but uh, at the Smithsonian, uh, they're all parallel, so you can see all four screens at the same time. It's even more like a surveillance. Like yeah, a so it's, 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 uh, like, it's also, the work is a document, as I see it. Uh, of uh, an aspect of New York City uh, that I'm very much involved in, in a way, uh, that is often ignored or it's too dramatized, you know, within a story. And here, a casual recording, which isn't so casual, really, but nothing was premeditated. You know? Everything, I would look through the viewer all, at all times the camera is also moving most of the time uh, in surveillance. You know. So we're talking about a work that is not part. Maybe I, we're going too far off. Or I'm going too far off. I, I apologize. But uh, coming back to uh, uh, departure and what we talked about, the rectangle, you know, relates to this really. You know. uh, just. Also, the whole the history of cinema, you know. Uh, I dig into things, uh, sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously, you know. So, uh, so I see threads that make things that happened a long time ago related to things that are happening now, either in my own work or in the work of other people. In Departure, the tracks in the, in the second section, mm -hmm. um, Makes, made me think of, uh, I guess, a zoetrope with the, because you start to see patterns with the speed of the movement yes. that develop. Yes, fantastic. Um, that's wonderful. I didn't even think about it, but that, that's true, yes. Zoetropes, panachidoscopes, and a number of other uh, names, uh, uh, stroboscopes, you know, uh, which is another word for uh, the phenakidoscope, you know, there were two individuals who actually came up with the same idea uh, almost at the same time as, you know, you know, Plateau in, Bel in Belgium and uh, Simon, God, I forgot his last name, in Vienna, came up with something called the stroboscope, you know, just a couple months later. You know, so, uh, and they were fairly similar ideas. Yeah. And there's also a flicker effect that kind of happens as well, so that's yes. more of an avant-garde yeah. tradition. But it, those are things that I could only see later. I, uh, I saw some things as I was looking out the window and when I was commuting back and forth between Boston and New York uh, before I picked up the camera to do that. Uh, but uh, it's only on tape later, on the monitor, that I began to see the full extent of those developments. You know, I, I wasn't so certain. You just 
do things and then you have to look at the footage you get back. You have to forget what your intentions were. What is happening right there on screen? You know? So you come back to the here and now rather than just um, being somewhere else you know, all the time, which is fine. You know, I, I appreciate that aspect of cinema too, although I'm not that interested in working that way. Well, even in Serene Velocity, like that's something that's very structured, but there are points in it that you commented on where, because of the hours you were shooting it at, you may have mistimed uh, the, the structure. So you can't even, when you're trying to fully control something, even then yeah. you... Yeah, uh, you, a, you cannot control everything. And if you do, you, uh, I would say as a generality, you're, you'll come out uh, with a dead piece. Uh, I, to me, it's very important that our work be able to breathe, to have a life of its own, uh, and not to just be able to follow the tracks uh, and the intentions of the filmmaker. Uh, you know, I mean, when you go to see a work, whatever work it is, you're seeing it for yourself. You want an experience. You want something that's going to give you something that will make your own life richer on some level, you know? Even if it's just passing time, my God, we only have one life, you know? So you want to live it as intensely as possible, and you want to broaden your horizons. So uh, just to follow this narrow track of what uh, the filmmaker wants, or uh, the painter or the writer, to me is uh, too constructive. Uh, there is need for me for things to have room for accident and for multiple interpretations. Quite often when I see works, they're too controlled. That's all I see often, or the ma my major experience is uh, this dictatorial control of, the, of uh, my response to things, and I recoil from that. Uh, it's not the intention of the filmmaker, but that's what I end up experiencing, and I pull back. I say, maybe interesting, but it's not for me. You know, in works that make it possible for me to have my own adventure into a work, uh, I'm much more interested in. How did you settle on the three, the, the use of three sections for departure? Uh, it's uh, okay. Let's see. Um, it's the footage that I, uh, I had to select from the footage that I had. I mean, I could go on, go on a train again and again, uh, but uh, those takes were taken towards the end of my uh, uh, commuting, you know, during that in the spring. So uh, the rest of the time I, I, I didn't uh, do any recording. So at the end of the spring, I was teaching at Harvard at the time and I was commuting back and forth. They wanted me to stay there, and I said, no, I live in New York. I <laughs> so they said, okay. So I commuted back and forth. So you have the, um, because I was trying to remember, did Waterfront Follies, was that in three sections or two? Oh, let's see. Yeah, isn't that funny? Well, there are number. okay, now that we're talking about number threes, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you may not have seen uh, Reverberation, which is one, two, uh, the third or the fourth piece that I did. Can't remember, the third uh, film I did. Yeah, the third, I think, uh, film. Uh, originally, it was f there were four uh, parts, and then I ended up taking the fourth out, and so it's uh, three sections, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Uh, with uh, departure, it's uh, I. Um, I usually do not edit uh, while I'm filming or taping. I work as long as I feel I can. When I feel I'm repeating myself, or I, uh, you know, in terms of departure, uh, well, the train ride is over. I'm not commuting back and forth now. Uh, so then I just take that uh, material. Sometimes I just l leave it sitting somewhere for a while. 
and then I work with what I have. And I can see that there are other possibilities. It could have other sections, yes. But I am also not so certain how much longer I would want to, how long I would want to make the work beyond what it is right now. Um, uh, the duration of the takes, uh, you know, is something I was debating all the way through. Uh, on the one hand, I said, given this is um, 2012, you know, can people, are people really have the patience for these long, drawn-out takes? And I said, that's the way I want it. it uh, there, there were reasons. I mean, even uh, theoret not theoretical, but experiential reasons. Uh, I felt, okay, uh, the way most of us are conditioned by cinema, uh, the first thing we do is uh, recognize the image, what it represents. Now, to start looking at it as a graphic image takes a while. So you have to push past the resistance to looking at it that way. Unless, you know, you're a sophisticated, uh, you know, audience or viewer, in which case you may just um, continue, you know. I mean, so as soon as something comes on screen, you go into that mo mode of thinking. But for mo most people who get to see this work, who have never seen this kind of cinema, um, you know, they recognize the image and then say, well, why isn't it over? Why isn't it over? No, uh, unless you walk out, you know, or you go to sleep, you start looking at that image and suddenly, hopefully, that part of the strategy is you start to look at what is actually taking place, you know, uh, there. What's happening on the borders of the rectangle within that image, the uh, optical contradictions are taking place, what might have been intended. It gives you, I, I need time to be able to reflect. One of the problems I have with, um, well, mainly, let's say, uh, with uh, coming attractions, you know, now. I mean, they always say, oh, what, what, what's going on? You know, and I don't want to do that. Uh, that's teasers to me, real teasers. Uh, and I, I uh, you know, I'm opposed. Uh, somebody else wants to do it, fine, but I'm not interested in that. You know, I, I want the opposite. Showing you something, okay, let's look at this. Let's have fun with this image. You know, don't just think about what is the message of this. You know, just have fun like a kid. You know, um, and uh, so. But there are other reasons. Uh, time is also important in terms of the piece itself. Uh, you know, as I said last night, uh, there's always some personal experience. Not always, but uh, often, let's say, in the work that has that drives me to make a particular piece. And uh, one of the recollections is that uh, this long train ride that seemed to go on forever. I'm sure it wasn't. You know, it's just like when you're a kid and you look at adults, they look gigantic. And in fact, they are not. But to a little toddler, you know, uh, an adult looks like a giant, you know. So, um, but that's part of it. Also, again, it, it's an, uh, stretching the time somehow is also a way of reaffirming the fact that you're looking at a time-based medium. It's like looking at paintings uh, where the brushstroke in the paint on the canvas is part of the experience of the work and you cannot move away from it. You're looking at a painting. It, it's a representation, yes, but you're also looking at paint on canvas. And this is the way it's been you know, put on, on, on the canvas. So. There's also the sound, too, and that's one thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah. But first I wanted to ask, was it, was it recorded using the cams uh, mic? Or was yeah, it? The, in, in, 
uh, I hate to say it, but you know, this was uh, I, uh, I, I, um, the first time I had a HD cam copy, a professional copy made at, at a lab. And my instructions were, uh, please do not make any changes. Uh, just transfer it as it is. Unfortunately, you know, there's a, uh, in video world or TV world, an aversion to blacks. So part of the image, the, the, it's much more uh, spatial in a way. Uh, uh, especially the last section, the, uh, the darkness around should not be dark gray, but black. That was not, the sound sounded too harsh for me, okay? And uh, I, I was really in pain about it. It was t uh, played too high, and that had nothing to do with the projection, as I thought it was great projection, uh, but they brought up the level too high uh, in the transfer. Mm. So uh, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know, both uh, pieces, you know. So uh, I, I was very unhappy with that. Um, in departure, the sound is all uh, synchronous. It's the, the sound, uh, that was the ambient sound that was taking place. Uh, and I could cut it off. I could put something else in it. But uh, in this occasion, and I may not be able to quite articulate it, I decided to so leave it. I felt this junk around <laughs> that had nothing to do with the image. Nothing to do, well, in a way it did, but uh, um, it, it felt right. Okay, I, I felt I didn't want to make it silent. Uh, that would have been making the image too precious. And I didn't want that. I also wanted some other way of reinstating, especially that first take. Uh, you know, uh, the coughing. I I found that amusing. You know, people. <coughs> you know, spring time. People have allergies. Mm. You know, or maybe a cough or whatever. <laughs> it wasn't my sound. Um, you know, so uh, luckily nobody was really talking, uh, and I was. Uh, you know, otherwise I might have had to edit that out, you know, uh, maybe, you know. So, um, but in that piece, uh, no creative work in terms of uh, really molding some sound relative to the image, you know, that wasn't originally recorded with the image. But I thought it was perfect for that reason because your, your films are very spatial. Yeah. Um, usually it's in the image documenting a space and that's occurring to some extent yeah. here, but the ambient sound that's synchronous creates yeah. the space like, kind of behind the camera. Yes. And right. it also adds a personal quality because as a viewer you're aware that there's someone recording this and they're sitting yeah. on the train. Yes. Good. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, th that was part of it. Uh, and part of what uh, was a little bit painful for me is that in the transfer, possibly because the sound was uh, too high, uh, it distorts uh, the fact you can hear the train tracks much more uh, when I play it at home. <laughs> and, you know, uh, AGO has, uh, I think, a very good sound system. So if I had just taken, uh, I, I actually had a backup system, and unfortunately we, I, I got to the theater too late to do this, but I wanted to compare it to the, uh, to the piece that I had on, uh, on an external drive, you know. Mm. And uh, hopefully, w I wanted to see what the image and the sound sounded on both. But by the time I got there, people were getting into the theater already, so it was too late to try anything. Uh, but uh, I would, would have liked uh, the ambient sound to be clearer, mm -hmm. no, not, not as uh, distorted as it was. It wasn't that distorted, but you know, it was too high and uh, a little bit muffled, I felt. So. Was the sound synchronous for Auto Collider 15? Oh, well? no. That's what I thought. No, absolutely not. Uh, I, uh, let's see, again, there are 19 pieces altogether. Mm -hmm. um, I'm tempted to go back and make a 20th, 
<laughs> but I don't think I want to. Uh, uh, there's a certain amount of sound. Uh, for Auto Collider, um, the original uh, footage um, was recorded for a very different piece. Uh, it was going to be an installation, a uh, multi-channel installation, uh, and uh, with very rever straight recordings, uh, just like uh, in Departure. Um, and uh, there was, uh, and it had to do with the automobile, actually, uh, and the way uh, it's transformed uh, the urban landscape in America, at least. I don't know what Canada is like. You know, I, I come here, here I am, two days, and <laughs> uh, in, in the middle of the city, uh, all I see is some, uh, in terms of activities, the same kind of things that I see in New York, you know. Uh, streets with cars and people, you know. And then I go to the airport and, uh, and disappear. But uh, I was living in San Francisco, so it's part of California, where the automobile has a more dominant role than it does. Uh, it's a huge state, you know, it goes very large. So people travel a lot by car. Um, and uh, what you, what I encountered in the past is that uh, not only in uh, California, but elsewhere. There's a, a way across America, uh, there's a way in which uh, what used to be the life of a, uh, of a city, you know, the center of the city, uh, a living place where people live and work, uh, somewhat being destroyed, A, by people moving to the suburbs, and then instead of shopping, in the center of the city or in their neighborhood, uh, shop, going to shopping malls. Uh, you know, and on one occasion, uh, we, my wife and I, we were driving down this street called Ocean Avenue. And uh, I said, holy cow, this is incredible. There, there was some, uh, there were a couple of high, uh, there's a high school, university, uh, some green uh, parking lots, uh, and then this uh, uh, shop, not shopping, but kind of a urban uh, business area, you know, uh, that was uh, the main section, you know, and then uh, a uh, uh, suburban, not suburban, but let's say residential area, and then after that, the end of the street, uh, and it was, and then you go near to a shopping mall. And uh, on Ocean Avenue, you'd hardly ever see people. I mean, occasionally you'd see some soul coming out of a store or going into a place. But, you know, the shopping malls were packed with people. And after hours, after school hours, quite often the kids, these high school kids, uh, instead of hanging around the streets, they would go hang around the shopping mall. It was more exciting to them. And to me, that was, you know, death. I said, oh, God, sitting around a shopping mall, that's where you date? <laughs> oh, uh, anyway, so um, I was interested in documenting and doing something about that. It was Ocean Avenue. But I, you know, in 2006, um, I don't know, you know, I'm not a gallery per. I don't have a gallery or don't approach them. So I didn't know where to show this work. So it got shelved. Um, 2009, I took this material and uh, began to uh, see what I could do to make a self-contained single screen piece. Mm. And that's how Auto Collider came into being the first one. Once I got the first one, it led to the second one, to the third one, to a whole series of auto colliders. And each one is different. Some of the material is sh shifted around, although beginning and endings are basically the same. You start in one place and you end in the other place, which you cannot see in 15 because you know, <laughs> there's no recognizable image. Yeah. But uh, 
but then material inside, both in terms of uh, the images themselves and the sounds, they're really shifted around. I play some things appear in some pieces and some sounds and images will not reappear in another piece. Uh, it was more than, uh, what is it, uh, let's say average 12 minutes. Actually, autocollider 15 is only nine minutes. Mm. So, uh, so it, it really, uh, I would use what seemed appropriate. I would take out what didn't feel right, uh, you know. So, um, so most of the pieces retain. Now, with Auto Collider, um, uh, the abstraction, uh, it still retains uh, very much for me uh, the initial impulse. It's not the optical represent il illustration of a car and of cars moving through space across an urban landscape. You don't see, but you, uh, you don't see the buildings or the people walking around, but uh, there are these colors. Those are the colors, urban colors. They're the colors of cars, like that red. I mean, where do you find those reds, yellows, whatever, you know? Uh, and the idea of motion, an indication of uh, speed, you know, that, that was enough. Uh, you know, and it's, some, it's something that I've been very much interested. How can you uh, represent an idea outside of the optical illustration of, let's say, if you want to deal with a person, how could you represent that person uh, in this medium, you know, which is a work of artifice to start with, um, without representing a face, <laughs> you know? That's what I was thinking watching it, is that the, the audio and the colors and yeah. the title all connote uh, automobiles yeah. moving and this horizontal movement yes. yeah. speeding past you. Yeah. But if you were to look at what's denotated, it's more vertical, it's lines of color that go yeah. up and down. Yes. Well, you know, things, well, actually, in that piece, you know, things are moving, half of it is moving. Uh, when things are moving this way on top, quite often below it's moving in the upper. You may not see it on first viewing, but it's, you know, this way or that yeah. way, you know. So, uh, yeah, there's a kind of a play between the upper section and the lower section. You know, but you can't tell, you know, it's always constantly moving in both directions, yeah. And it's also interesting because I only saw the one and my experience is rooted only in that one, but yeah. obviously there are, is an entire uh, theme that's being buried throughout the 19 and some have more recognizable images. Yeah. Um, how, does, how does that work when people maybe will only be seeing one as opposed to the whole collection? Uh, well, uh, that's something you could answer uh, better than I can. Um, you know, I, uh, the selection of the works uh, was not mine. You know, I showed a certain number of works and uh, since Andrea was putting together, uh, uh, you know, group programs, she had to select and she wanted to show some of them, she had to make a choice, you know. So I think it's okay. Mm. I, I have shown actually uh, on one other occasion, one piece. Most of the time I've shown two. Mm. Uh, the few times that I've shown it so far. Uh, maybe next time I might show three. <laughs> you know, so uh, most of them have recognizable images, but um, stretching the word recognizable image. It starts with uh, a recognizable image. Something happens to it. All right. It's like walking into a hall of mirrors where there are uh, changes. You know, you look at this mirror, and you know, uh, you, you know, it's this. Uh, you see a distorted person or whatever. Different. You know, uh, the upper portion looks funny in one way, the lower portion in a different way. Right? You, you've been to those yeah, things. Yeah. So, um, so um, likewise, the image is stretched. Mm in different ways. 
when I say stretched, I'm, I'm not thinking of autocollider right there. I'm just thinking of it in terms of uh, in an abstract sense. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a word uh, can have many different connotations, yeah? so too can an image. Thanks, sir. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully some of it is I'll here. I'll put it all. I'll use yeah? it all. Oh, okay.